Welcome to the 2015 Ida B. and Beyond Conference, presented by the School of Journalism and Electronic Media at the University of Tennessee. Held in conjunction with the Association for Education and Journalism and Mass Communications 40th Annual Southeast Colloquium, this conference is a component of the Ida B. Wells Initiative, an interdisciplinary project to foster student and scholarly research on Ida B. Wells and other social justice crusaders. The 2015 Ida B. and Beyond Conference is brought to you by UT's Ready for the World program, the Vice Chancellor for Diversity, the Commission for Blacks, the College of Communication and Information at the University of Tennessee, the School of Journalism and Electronic Media, the Department of History and other private donations. How's everybody doing? All right. <laughs> okay. So this picture of Ida B. Wells hung in the Tennessee Newspaper Hall of Fame here on campus for the last four years. I always wondered about her on my way to class. It was a wall of primarily white men. So Ida stood out. I took Dr. Rosner's media history class and began to learn more about Wells. And the more I learned about her journalism, the more I began to wonder if I could do something similar. She did not just report the events of her time. She advocated for change in the way America reacted to those events. So I had to find out, who was I to be Wells? She was born in Holly Springs, Mississippi during the Civil War and emancipated from slavery by the Emancipation Proclamation. At age 16, she assumed responsibility for her five brothers and sisters after the yellow fever killed their parents. She moved to Memphis. She became a school teacher. But everything changed in 1884 when she refused to move out of first class while riding on the Chesapeake, Ohio and Southern Railroad. She sued the railroad for forcing blacks to ride in inferior carriages, winning in a local court before losing in the Supreme Court. Writing an article about the incident in an African-American Memphis newspaper would catapult her into newspaper work for the rest of her life. Her claim to fame would become her anti-lynching crusade, which forced the issue of Southern lynchings into the national and international conversation. She also advocated for women's suffrage, making a strong stand that color before gender was the only way to justice. In her later years, she became an advocate for the rights of the black accused. And in her personal life, she married Ferdinand Burnett and would raise four children with him. Motherhood, however, did not distract her from her life's work, advocating for racial justice through journalism. So then the next question, what exactly is advocacy journalism? As you can see, Media Ethics Magazine defines advocacy journalism as a form of journalism that endeavors to be fact-based but does not separate editorial opinion from news coverage. Compare it to yellow journalism at the turn of the century, Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer's style of melodramatic, sensationalist, exaggerated reporting. Or maybe critical journalism. Think Woodward and Bernstein, Watergate coverage, exposing a scandal. More recently, you could consider it comparable to radical journalism. It's a term coined by John Downing in a 1984 study of rebellious communication and social movements. In today's media world, as online platforms allow more citizen journalists to reach wider audiences, this form of opinionated advocacy journalism is growing more and more prevalent. As journalists, we need to develop a methodology for successful ethical advocacy journalism. Which brings us back to Wells. What methods did Ida B. Wells use in order to advocate for change through journalism? In my research, I found three distinct points that she used in different movements. Whether it was anti-lynching, women's suffrage, or the rights of the black accused. In each instance, she relied on explicit and detailed facts, appealed to diverse audiences, and suggested a solution to the problem. Let's examine anti-lynching first. So her close friend, Thomas Moss, was lynched. And she, uh, in 1893, she delivered a talk at Tremont Temple in Boston about the experience. This is what she said. The mob dragged out these young men hatless and shoeless, put them on an engine of the railroad, carried them a mile north of city limits 
and horribly shot them to death. The papers told how one got hold of the guns of the mob, and as his grasp could not be loosened, his hand was shattered with a pistol ball, and all the lower part of his face was torn away. To hear a young woman describe such violence with such deliberate detail shocked many at the time, and the shock factor bolstered the effect of her speech. But even more shocking than her public speeches were the pamphlets that she published about lynching. In 1895, she published a red record. She devoted much of its pages to three years' worth of lynching statistics gathered from around the country. The data counter countered a popular Southern myth that violent lynchings were justified by violent rapes. But Wells found that of 160 black lynchings in 1892, only 57 charged the victim with rape or attempted rape. It's roughly a third. She included the details of many of these lynching victim stories. And she included two that were identified only as boy and girl. In the case of the boy and girl above referred to, she wrote, their father was accused of the murder of a white man. His 14-year-old daughter and 16-year-old son were hanged and their bodies filled with bullets. Then the father was also lynched. This was in November 1892 at Jonesville, Louisiana. These details were hard for a lot of people to, to read, not often reported in the white newspapers. And they forced the readers to acknowledge the horror of lynchings. The only problem was the audience was limited. So, Wells accepted an invitation in 1893 to lecture in England and Scotland. This gets into the second point of her advocacy journalism, appealing to diverse audiences. Just as Frederick Do Douglass used international attention to fuel the abolition movement, Wells used international attention to propel her anti-lynching crusade. Before she left, a group of prominent Brits started an anti-lynching committee to investigate and expose lynching. And stateside, Wells wrote back to black and white audiences by writing articles and letters in black and white newspapers. But Wells' journalism wasn't just about audience and facts. Those methods are true of any journalism. She had a third method. She always proposed a solution. In Southern Horrors, which was her first pamphlet on lynching, Wells suggested African Americans boycott white businesses as patrons and workers. Three years later, in the Red Record, her solution evolved, and she instructed her readers to disseminate facts, protest lynchings, and boycott white businesses. So this was how I first discovered her methodology and her anti-lynching work. But then I began to wonder if she used the same methodology in the women's suffrage campaign and uh, her defense of the black accused. So let's look at her role in women's suffrage. As a black woman, Wells' voice was consistently dismissed by white suffragists. One was Frances Willard, the national president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. She said in an 1890 interview with the New York Voice that the safety of white women, of childhood, and of the home is menaced in a thousand localities. The colored race multiplies like the locusts of, e of Egypt. In an overseas editorial, Wells quoted Willard directly. She pointed out that Willard's remarks implicitly condoned lynch marks, mobs. The dispute eventually ended, and Willard eventually accepted an invitation to join London's anti-lynching com committee. It was a win for Wells, achieved through the use of explicit facts. In this case, she allowed her enemy to fall on her own sword. Next, how did she diversify her audience? In 1913, Ida Wells traveled to Washington, D.C. to march in a national suffrage parade. Upon arrival, she discovered that some Southern delegates ob objected to her presence, and she was told that she could not march with her state. She, instead of not marching with her state, she quietly slipped out of the African-American contingent and back into her state section. This wasn't exactly journalism, but the actions that she conducted at the parade garnered attention in the black and white press. And for the thousands of suffragists that were there, they were forced to consider the hypocrisy of racism in a supposedly democratic suffrage movement. This example suggests that sometimes an advocate journalist must be an activist first. So then we see how she exemplified a solution. I, again, I'd say that this journalist as activist theme reappears in her work. In 
The same year as the suffrage march, Illinois passed a limited suffrage law. Ida published pamphlets, appeared at women's organizations, and at her own Alpha Suffrage Club, and she helped generate 153,000 women votes. In her autobiography, she would later write that her men politicians were surprised because not one of them, not even the ministers, had said one word to influence women to take advantage of the suffrage opportunity Illinois had given. She also reported on the inaction of the Chicago Women's Club. Fanny Barrier Williams, a black woman, was refused membership for 14 months. But after Wells' article was published, Williams was accepted, becoming the club's first African-American member and exemplifying the value of Wells' solution. Writing about suffrage gave her an audience, but practicing actual advocacy through the Alfred Suffrage Club gave her legitimacy. The journalist's activist theme would manifest itself most clearly in the twilight of Wells' public life, when she devoted much of her time to defending the rights of the black accused. This first example uh, came in 19, is, relates to a 1905 law passed in Illinois that stated if any prisoner was captured by a lynch mob and killed, that the sheriff would be um, stripped, of his, stripped of his duties because he had not done all he could do to protect the prisoner. Four years later, after the law was passed, uh, it was called into question. A man was lynched by a crowd of 10,000 people, having first been stolen from Sheriff Frank Davis's custody. The governor did remove the Davis sheriff from office, but the sheriff petitioned to get his job back. Wells investigated, defending, if not exactly the rights of a black man accused, the justice of a black man murdered. She in interviewed 25 local black citizens, as well as the deputies, she presented her case at the hearing, and the judge ruled, after her testimony, that Davis should not be reinstated because he had not been disarmed by the mob. This particular case, again, reflects more activism than journalism, but the journalistic nature of her investigation, the interviews that she conducted, the research that she conducted, these methods speak to the overall effect of concrete evidence and advocacy. But what good is evidence without someone to see it? In 1915, Wells employed her tried and true tactic of addressing a diverse audience about a racial injustice. In this case, it was the story of Chicken Joe Campbell, a black inmate who was accused of murdering the warden's wife. He was assigned to solitary confinement with no further investigation. And after 40 hours in darkness, third degree questioning, and bread and water rationing, Campbell confessed to the crime. At his testimony later, he would retract that confession and insist on his innocence. When Wells heard of the news, she wrote a letter to James Keeley, the editor of a white Chicago newspaper. She wrote, would we stand to see a dog treated in such a fashion without protest? By using a white newspaper to protest Campbell's treatment, Wells diversified the audience of her advocacy. But at the same time, she wrote letters to the city's largest black newspaper, organizing a campaign to pay for Campbell's court costs and illustrating once again the value of appealing to different groups of people. Still, her advocacy journalism is not complete without proposing a solution. And in the instance of the rights of the black accused, Wells did much more than propose a solution. She became one. Consider the story of Leroy Bundy, a black dentist charged with the murder of two policemen during the East St. Louis race riots of 1917. He faced a disproportionately longer sentence compared to the sentences received by whites. Wells interviewed him in his cell convinced of his innocence, and got to work fighting the conviction. She published a pamphlet about the riots, using her typical methods of detailed facts to tug on the hearts of her readers. She also tried to generate more national attention by appealing to another black Chicago newspaper, The Broad Axe. With the help of her husband, Wells saw Bundy win his freedom. In this instance, her solution wasn't a published letter in a pamphlet, but rather personal action, raise money, get personally involved. Personal involvement was normal for her. Four years before the Leroy Bundy case, Wells took a full-time job as Chicago's first black adult probation officer. Through, the work, through her work at the Negro Fellowship League, which she started, Wells helped young black men into employment opportunities. Again, these are not explicit published solutions, but rather individual actions that became solutions in themselves. This semester, the university took down the picture of Ida B. Wells that I looked at for the last four years. 
they were replaced in the Hall of Fame with a new digitized version. Though the picture is gone, the legacy of Ida B. Wells remains. As an example for the new wave of advocacy journalists in the 21st century, she showed us how to employ explicit and detailed facts and address diverse audiences to achieve our goals. Most importantly, in her life and in her writings, she consistently reminded us that an advocate is only as valuable as the solutions he or she proposes. Going forward, journalists who wish to enact change in the world around them should apply her model of advocacy journalism if they hope to find the success that she did. Thank you. Good morning. I was going to sit, um, but folks over here would not have been able to see me. So maybe I can just put this laptop. Can you yeah, get this for me? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. I was a bit about to get a bit unnerved because so much of what I'm going to say, or perhaps was going to say, RJ just did. Um, but I am looking at Ida B. Wells from a different perspective. Um, we know that she was a journalist and activist, and you've heard about that this morning again. When I was working on my first book on pioneering African-American women journalists, uh, and I'm a PR practitioner by professional practice, so to speak. But um, as I looked at her advocacy journalism, I said to myself, this anti-lynching campaign is really a public relations campaign. And so I'm pointing out today that Ida B. Wells became a social reformer largely through the practice of public relations. And so, if we look at one definition of public relations, it says that it is the propagation of a cause, a doctrine, or a program. And that is exactly what Ida B. Wells did. We as pra practitioners know that campaigns are major tools in the arsenal of public relations practice. They are concerted efforts that enable an organization to build socially responsible relationships by achieving research-based goals through the application, and I'm reading this definition verbatim, through communicative strategies and the measurement of the outcomes. Wells' anti-lynching campaign did exactly that. If we look at the components of public relations, they include what we like to call ropes, which is research, objectives, programming, and in programming we can have um, st um, strategies, messages, tactics, special events. We also have evaluation. And finally, we have stewardship. And I said to myself, Wells's campaign implored that. And then I looked and I said, okay, Wells did this in 1893. That is when she began. And I said to myself, well, Ivy Lee led better who is known as the father of public relations when John D. Rockefeller hired him during the Colorado coal miners strike in 1913 and 14, specifically to mold public opinion. I said to myself, well, Ida B. was doing that in 1893. And so that fits the paradigm. And I'm all of public relations, but it also allows me to argue that she belongs with the early public relations practitioners or pioneers, that's a little redundant, Edward Bernays, the first PR consul, Arthur Page, Carl Boyer, and the like. And so my study then adds a new dimension to Wells' career and her contributions. It changes or it adds to how she fits into the media landscape not just as activist and journalist, but as consummate public relations practitioner who accomplished social reform through utilizing public relations strategies and tactics. So some might ask, well, why is that important? Well, it expands the knowledge of who practiced early public relations and why they did it. 
No African American and very few women are recognized in the literature as having practiced public relations during that time period, as early as the late 1800s. Wells did. But just as significantly, my research shows that Wells understood and employed PR theory. She understood uh, and knew how to use systematic persuasion to bring about political and social change, again, making her a social reformer as she pursued that cause, that abolition of lynching in this country at the turn of the 20th century. I looked at, I went back and I poured over my book, the first chapter on Ida B. I went back and I read um, Mita Bay's book, uh, Mia Bay's book that I reviewed for journalism history, and I got some more facts there, which I won't be able to share in the interest of time, and she'll probably do that during her talk. I looked at two other uh, biographies of Wells. I looked at her pamphlets, because I wanted to see the extent to which her messages also adhered to this public relations paradigm. I wanted to look at whether her goal, what her goals were and how they fit into public relations. And I found that her goals were informational, attitudinal, and behavioral at that time period. That is what we do when we judge public relations campaigns now. We look to see whether those goals fit in with that. So first, she sought to create awareness of the real re reasons for the lynching of blacks and the impact lynchings had on blacks and of society. She sought to create information and debunk the myth that lynching was a just cause for the rape of white women. And as RJ pointed out, she showed in detail that if you happen to be the son or the daughter of that poor soul who was being lynched, you were taken along for good measure and lynched in much the same manner as they were. She told those kinds of stories to accomplish that second goal, which was attitudinal change, because she hoped to stir moral outrage that this crime occurred and that the nation sat back and just allow it to occur. And ultimately, as we do in PR, we aim for a behavioral change. And the behavior that Wells was looking for was for state, legislature, state, state legislators and Congress to ban lynching, to pass anti-lynching legislation. So if we look at that ropes process again, we know in PR that research is the first step. Wells conducted painstaking research, and she allowed that research, or that research enabled her to uh, frame her messages and come up with her strategies and tactics. RJ pointed out that she uh, used newspapers. She pored over newspapers, obtaining statistics from those newspapers, quoting from those newspaper articles. That in public relations goes to the heart of what we try to do, to produce credible arguments that are buttressed with statistics. Why am I having trouble with that word this morning? Um, she also traveled to where lynchings occurred and interviewed family members, interviewed townspeople, interviewed people in the media to get her information and to lend credibility to her messages. And where did she put forth these messages? Because the communication channels in public relations are also very important. Of course, black publications, the New York Age, um, the Free Speech, which was her publication, um, the Chicago Defender, the Broad Axe in Chicago, the AME Church Review. Establishment newspapers also ran her uh, stories are her letters to the editor. And she wrote that the Chicago Inter-Ocean was the only paper in the United States which had done anything in a systematic way to expose the lynching infamy. It ran all of her letters and all of her stories when she was 
in Great Britain um, on that tour. And speaking of England and Scotland, her letters to the editor ran in the Birmingham Daily Post and the Liverpool Daily Post. And when someone wrote, um, and, well, I'll wait until I get to that part about uh, international, uh, her trips abroad, and remind me if I forget that point. Um, but um, as I said, she understood that awareness must first be created, and that's what we say in public relations, you create the awareness first. Um, and then you proceed from there to try to create attitudinal and behavioral change. We know that in public relations, that awareness is created through message exposure, getting the reader to pay attention to the message, um, to understand the message, to retain the message, to accept it, and ultimately to act. That is what her messages did it followed that very paradigm. We also know that in public relations, messages have to be repeated, even as for them to be persuasive, they have to be um, repeated, even as they inform. And again, public relations says, messages must be credible and produced by credible spokesperson. The other thing that Wells did she utilized theories that we talk about in public relations and in media. She framed the issue of lynching, pointing out that the myth was not the truth. She wanted to frame that, she wanted to frame lynching as an inhuman, inhumane issue, and she wanted to appeal to humanity's consciousness and tell humanity that it could do better. Um, so I was going to talk about her first campaign in the free speech, but RJ talked about that. So her three pamphlets, because PR does not, and I tell this to my students, you don't just send out press releases, students. You must use other communication vehicles, and you must use different kinds of activities. So in addition to beginning that campaign in the pages of the free speech, those three pamphlets that RJ talked about, the same message was in those pamphlets. The second pamphlet, the Red Record, um, is, is called The First History of Lynching in the United States. So I'll fast forward to the conferences that she either called or attended where she gave the same message that economic repri reprisal, uh, political reasons, blocking the black vote, and sheer racial prejudice were the real incentives for lynching, not raping African-American uh, men, um, not raping white women. And so she took that message across, um, overseas because she understood that international pressure might be able to convince the United States to end that infamy, which is what she called it. Uh, she pointed out that um, she, she wrote letters in Great Britain, she went to tea, she went to meetings, and everywhere she went, she gave that same message, always utilizing statistics. And so at the, in the end, we look at stewardship. What did this campaign accomplish? Wells's campaign accomplished the banning of lynching in six southern states, according to historians. So it had a lasting effect. It did bring about social change, made her a social reformer, and I've just given you a quick overview of how exactly she did that. And so I don't think I was too redundant here, hopefully I wasn't, but we can now think of Ida B. Wells not only as a journalist and an activist, but as one of the first public relations practitioners in the United States. So 
Hello, my name is Danny Nice Woods. Um, I go by Danny, and I'm a first year doctoral student at the University of Southern Mississippi. So initially, I went about to research on Ida B. Wells, and um, I searched various topics, trying to look for something original, but um, there's, when you research Ida, there's always this little line. She was married to Ferdinand L. Barnett, and they'll say he was a prominent journalist, influential lawyer, that's pretty much it. <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, who was this man? If he was such a journalist and this influential attorney, then maybe that's my story. So, let's see. so my uh, paper kind of looks at the life and work of Ferdinand L. Barnett. Um, there's a biographical sketch of his life, the themes of his work, and also his life as a husband, father, and activist. So some of the background information, of course, he was a journalist in the um, Reconstruction era, pretty much after the Civil War. So he was informing newly emancipated African Americans. And a lot of the research deals with the crusade for justice. Um, there's also a publication about her diary. Um, and there's also a collection at the University of Chicago um, of Ida B. Wells papers. So in there, there is a scrapbook of Ferdinand L. Barnett. Also, you can find some research about Barnett in the um, in publications about Black Chicago, so about political and the African American press. So, also looking, I looked into her autobiography. There are some stuff about Barnett, um, like I said, the papers, and there are interviews from their youngest daughter, who is Alfreda Duster. So, the early life is a bit sketchy. So his parents, um, it said that his father was actually probably a slave who actually bought his freedom and they moved to Canada. And um, when they got back, probably, you know, when he started high school or so, and he grew up and so he went to Jones School, Chicago High, and then later the Union College of Law. Um, he was also married for, um, to another woman initially. Um, her name was Mary, um, Henrietta Graham. She was actually the first African-American to be admitted and graduated from the University of Michigan, and they have two children. Some of his accomplishments was that he was the first African-American assistant state attorney of Illinois. He also founded one of the first African-American newspapers in Chicago, which was called The Conservator. He was also the first African-American candidate to run for municipal judge in Cook County, which is where Chicago is. So some of the things of his early work was about educating his audience to become self-sufficient, calling them to action. You know, how can we elevate our race? How can we progress African-Americans? So some of the themes found in his work is about racial unity, cultural and formal education, financial stability, organizations, societies, and clubs, and political involvement and voting rights. So racial unity. He was actually a member of the national, um, well, there was a conference for the National um, Conference of African American Men. And he was actually one of the delegates from Illinois. And this was in 1879. Um, so some of the things are about, you know, coming together as a race. We can even echo that today. We can say that there's divisions, you know, among especially African Americans and how we can't come together as a community. Um, also ending jealousy. You know, if someone succeeds, you know, not to be jealous or angry against them, against them kind of help them along. Um, also how leaders can be examples to others. Um, he says the race elevation can only be attained through race unity. So I also look at culture and formal education. So cultural can be through newspapers, announcements, speeches, and the word of mouth. So it doesn't mean that you have to go to school for this type of education. I guess you can say it's street knowledge, but just that information to know what you need in life. Um, I also say formal education was important because of public schools and colleges to get ahead. He also thought that you know the school system need to hire more African American teachers. Um, he believed in the mixed school systems. 
which at the time there were actually some um, in the late um, 1800s. So he also touched on financial stability, you know, thinking about money and wealth, um, how to keep them, not to just spend them uh, meaningfully, you know, maybe invest in a home, something that will keep you um, putting your money towards it, okay, so that you can pass it on to your future generations. Um, finding a job, he also um, pleaded with um, employers about hiring more African Americans in their trades, um, how you can support black businesses, you know, make an investment early in life and labor to keep it increasing. So some of the organizations, society, and club, he thought it was important to join organizations, just like we are. We are in an organization or we're learning and it's a learning thing to help us with our education. So any type of club or organization or society that you're involved in, it's about how to make your profession better, how to make a better you. So he thought it was important to be educated and to have articulate speech. I um, also thought it would build character and practice debates, public speaking. So he also believed in political involvement, which is what led him to become an attorney. So he thought legislation was the key to African Americans getting rights. So he believed in women's suffrage, and he was actually published this article. Someone, you know, wanted to know what was his beliefs on women's rights and women's suffrage, and he actually argued that, you know, do you, these women are the mothers; um, they're the nurturers of children. Do you not think that they wouldn't protect the interests of those children? So they should definitely vote for someone who has that interest in heart. Um, he also believed in voting and the Republican Party, but he was saying don't just vote for the Republican Party, you know, just because they're the ones who are credited with emancipating the race. You know, you need to look into what our candidates are about and how they can help um, our rights. So the Crusaders. So of course he married Ida B. Wells in 1895. Um, their crusade was about equal rights to fight against um, discrimination, segregation, and the injustice of blacks. He actually allowed his wife to have a dominant and public role. So together they became one of the most influential African American families in Chicago. Um, so things that she was a part of was the African Afro-American Council, which is kind of one of the earliest um, civil rights organizations. And she was over the Anti-Lynching Bureau. At the time in 1901, they were having their third annual meeting and she was pregnant at the time with their third child, so she was unable to go. So he went in her place to represent her. He was also a member, but he would take the work that she had done and present it. Um, also, when she was pregnant, she still did international tours. So we talked about that, how she went you know, overseas to, to uh, Britain. She actually went twice. So later, when, after she had a baby, um, he actually helped have a nurse to go along with the, with the child to take care of it. And that started a practice of when she went to these events, there was a caretaker there. Um, also, one of the events was a Cairo lynching, which I'll later get into. Well, I'm sorry. Um, the Cairo lynching, um, this actually happened before the East Illinois, um, East riots in Illinois. So there was actually a prisoner, his name was Frog, and he was accused of, you know, attacking a white woman. And the law at the time was saying that if he's in protective custody, nothing should happen to him. You know, can't have a group of angry mob and come attack him, but that's what happened in, his cus in a deputy's custody. So at the time, um, the deputy was actually fired by the governor but he had the right to appeal being fired. And Ida knew this, Ferdinand knew this. Ferdinand's the assistant state attorney, so he can't say that's wrong, you know, and go out there and be the public face of it. So he sent Ida. Ida actually didn't want to go. Um, 
she was at, and in her autobiography, she said, well, I, I, you know, that has nothing, you know, what, what does that have to do with me? I'm staying at home. And so her son actually says, well, mama, if you don't go, who will? So Ferdinand had, you know, a, a ticket for a train and she went, he prepared a legal brief for her. He sent it ahead and he said, when you get there, you know, I'll have this prepared. So this was her information to help stop this deputy from being reinstated. Um, this is just one of the events. Of course, we talked about the advocacy journalism. Um, we talked about appealing to state senators and congressmen. She did this with her husband's help. He had to be, you know, behind the scenes doing this because he, like I said, he was the assistant state attorney. But a lot of the research that she had and the knowledge that she had, the, the facts, the statistics, the legal know-about was because of Ferdinand Burnett. Back. Okay, so uh, according to Wells, even herself, which is one of the reasons why she wrote her own autobiography, she, she said there is such a lack of authentic race history of Reconstruction times written by the Negro himself. One of the reasons why we have this conference, more knowledge about her. So in, in one of the things that there needs to be more knowledge about her husband, which is limited. Um, I, I argue that he can be a case study for a 19th century journalist and lawyer who provided a guiding voice to emancipated African Americans. He was an early leader in civil rights. Um, you know, he's, he's one of those forgotten cases, which there are several in history. Um, and my paper just pretty much opens up the discussion. I believe there's much more to look into, especially even after today and the certain things that she did certain laws that she changed, talking to prisoners, and you know, so I think there's much more that can be explored about him, but I hope that, you know, it leads scholars to thinking about him. All right, wonderful. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. I'm very fortunate to be um, a part of this. This is um, one study in a much larger study that uh, I have been working on. <clears throat> so um, this is just a very small snippet of a much larger study. Um, and I will try to um, go quickly because Amber has threatened us. So um, basically what um, this study did is it systematically looked at anniversary coverage, um, newspaper coverage, of Ida B. Wells during key civil rights periods, um, and specifically what it does is it looks at um, her anti-lynching campaign from 1892 and then um, her death in 1931. Um, what I was interested in looking at is the reflection in American public memory, so how are people remembering Ida, if at all? Um, and I would argue, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with the operation of politics of memory, um, with media being cultural spaces, um, but also there seems to be some sort of a cultural amnesia. Um, and any of you uh, who are educators can hopefully attest to this. Um, when you talk about Ida B. Wells to students or uh, you know friends, et cetera, um, a lot of people are, you know, who is that? I've never heard of her. And I always kind of have this mini conniption when I you know talk about, you know, what are you doing? I'm presenting at this Ida B. Wells conference. Well, who is that? I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? Um, so we've talked about, uh, the panel's talked about this morning how important she was, how she was a crusader, she fought for women's rights, she fought for uh, the black race, she did all of these absolutely fantastic, wonderful things, but so many people have no clue who she is, and I think that's largely problematic. Um, so I, I looked at the media to see, uh, you know, what, if any, role they may play in that. Um, and then there's also this concept, um, which was touched on a little bit um, from uh, Bell Hooks, the, the double bind. Basically, it's a dilemma in communication uh, where you're presented as an either or. Um, it's, it's conflicting things. Um, and a lot of uh, times when you talk about Ida B. Wells, she's presented, um, you know, race or gender. Um, so when we talk about um, uh, the suffrage issues, for instance, when we talk about women, a lot of times we're, we're referring to the white women position. 
Um, whereas at the same time, when we talk about um, anti-lynching crusade, uh, the black race, we look at it from a black male perspective. So there's, a, there's an entire population that, that a lot of times seems to be missing. Um, and Ida B just fits perfectly in that intersection of race and gender. All right, so with this, um, a couple of uh, theorists and uh, methodology that was used. Um, Carolyn Kitch has done a lot of uh, anniversary journalism. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, she's uh, done a lot for basically talking about what's remembered um, through media, but also what's forgotten through media. Uh, Barbara Fields and Gail Biederman uh, do a lot, um, in addition to James Carey, looking at race and gender um, as ideological products. Um, but uh, Fields and Biederman actually remind that above all, these products are also historical products. Um, and that's something to definitely keep in mind. Um, so what this study did is it looked at local, regional, and national newspaper coverage through a ProQuest historical newspapers database search. Um, and then using narrative and discourse analysis. So I looked at the structure of text, but then I also went a step further and looked at the text in relation um, to its cultural and political context. Um, and I will put a, a small caveat. Um, I am a critical scholar, so a lot of things that I found uh, kind of made me question and want to dig deeper. So I will try to stay um, at the you know, more superficial level with this study, um, but it hopefully will raise some questions um, with you as well. Um, so the specific anniversary dates that we looked at were the 25th, 50th, 75th, and 100th anniversary dates um, of <clears throat> these two instances. Again, we've already talked about the um, 1892 lynching of her three friends. Um, and this was really important because it did spark her anti-lynching uh, campaign, um, but also Wells herself described um, the Memphis lynching as one of the first lessons in white supremacy and also set her on a course of action to, quote, uh, tell the truth freely, uh, end quote. So, um, well, um, uh, text that this path would also in time, quote, make her the most famous black woman in America, end quote. So again, we're talking about the most famous black woman in America at this time, but yet people a lot of times don't know who she is now, and that's, that's a huge disconnect right there. Um, and then again, also her death in 1931. Um, obviously, the 100th anniversary hasn't happened yet, so that's why you only see the three years there. All right, so what I found were 79 articles uh, describing or talking about Ida B. Wells, um, but the majority of them really only mentioned her name in passing. It didn't go into context, it didn't go into detail, um, it really just um, named her, you know, there was maybe a small, um, a short brief about her, um, or an award in her honor, so something is named after her. Um, there was very, very minimal um, context that was provided, but when it was, it was described in terms of race. All right, so the first one, uh, the 1892 anniversary coverage. Um, I found no articles for the 25th anniversary of this from 1917. Um, however, the 50th uh, anniversary in 1942 yielded three articles. Um, they only focused on her name, so it was just basically mentioning her name, so it did pop up in the search, but it really didn't provide um, context. Um, now, this was something that I thought was very interesting. Um, because the three articles, <clears throat> excuse me, two of them talked about grassroots efforts to preserve the memory. Um, but when it talked about preserving her memory, it didn't do that at all because it didn't talk about any of the context of who Ida was. Um, so this is actually an example from uh, a 1942 uh, article. Um, and this is, again, the critical side of me just wanting to point this out. There is an appalling ignorance on the part of Negro school children as well as their elders so it shifts the responsibility of, okay, well, people don't know who she is, but ultimately, whose fault are they placing it on? I'm not saying whose fault is it, because we can't name that, but whose fault are they placing it on um, is definitely problematic. Um, for the 75th anniversary, <clears throat> uh, there were three articles found, um, but only one provided some sort of a, of a context, um, and this was also the first instance of finding context in relation to these news stories about Ida B. Wells. Um, so something just to keep in mind, you know, what was occurring in 1967, what had just happened. Um, a lot of uh, scholars <clears throat> uh, point at this cultural amnesia because it's the civil rights movement. We're trying to get past this painful history. Um, but I would question as a critical scholar, does that mean we need to negate it and not talk about it because we're trying to forget it? Um, so um, with this, uh, this was the one that provided some sort of a context in it. Um, talking about how she wrote fiery editorials in Memphis um, and then became active uh, to promote racial justice uh, and organize Negro women's clubs. 
Um, and then finally, the 100th anniversary of the uh, killing of her friends uh, had nine articles that were found. Again, they were very brief. Um, and this was something I thought was really interesting because it shifted the story's content to be more celebratory in nature. So um, they were much more, um, I guess, more upbeat, if you will, um, but they still had very, very minimal context to it. Um, so this one talks about the tribute to Ida B. Wells, the anti-lynching crusader who published the free speech um, newspaper and worked closely with Frederick Douglass. Um, and then this one, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, will recognize the contributions of the black press and spotlight Ida B. Wells, who used her pen to protest racism, sexism, and other indig indignities. And then finally, uh, the salute included uh, the christening of the Ida B. Wells Excellence in Media Award honor uh, in terms of uh, looking at her as a journalist. And, and I thought this was um, kind of interesting. I saw the poster out front. Uh, they did such a wonderful job, um, but they refer to her as the princess of the black press, which I found um, very interesting because when you think about Ida B. Wells, and um, she's talked about often as a crusader, um, she was a protester, um, but then they threw princess in there, which kind of, you know, makes you think, at least I hope. Um, so shifting into the 1931 anniversary coverage, again, this is um, the year that she died, so looking at the 25th, 50th, and 75th anniversaries of this, um, there's only one article found at the 25th anniversary um, that really just mentioned her name, um, so again, the context was largely missing there. Um, and then in 1981, the 50th anniversary, there were 11 articles found um, with minimal context. So again, um, you know, what was happening during this time, um, if you think about uh, what was going on in terms of racially um, in, the, uh, in the country, what was happening. So race was often um, described with other topics. So this one was race and politics, talked about her being a political pioneer who knew how to work in um, organized politics, uh, headed by powerful white political bosses. And this is, again, the critical part, trying to keep out of it, but I can't. Um, working in an era, uh, an era, excuse me, when her people had nothing like the political leverage blacks have today. So signifying that blacks have political leverage today. Um, and this is in 1981, by the way. Um, also, uh, race and journalism. So they talked a lot about her race, but also about the journalistic aspect of her. Um, so the crusading black newspaper woman for whom the award is named. Um, also, a lot uh, of uh, literature talks about her wonderful speaking ability, and this was echoed in the Chicago Tribune article, um, talking about her as a black and gifted Republican campaigner who could hold uh, the audience spellbound for hours. Um, now, two articles did uh, pop out as offering a little bit more of, of uh, depth and, and coverage in, uh, from 1981. Um, the first one was actually... Um, it was a, a review about a, a Lynn Thigpen um, show where she basically played eight women in a one-woman show, and the second one was a feature about anti-lynching. Um, so this is the one that was uh, referred to in the New York Amsterdam News, um, talking about uh, Ida B. Wells in this one-woman show. Um, so <clears throat> I'll let you read that. I'm not going to read it. Um, but basically, uh, to talk about her, it had to be in the context of, of a play. Um, so again, there's, there's still that disconnect of, you know, reality with, uh, you know, something on the stage. Um, and then this one was from, <clears throat> excuse me, the scanner from Portland, Oregon, um, talking about um, the anti-lynching um, crusade and how she was the editor of the Memphis Free Press. She was forced to leave Memphis. Um, but again, it, it didn't really go into detail. It just kind of skimmed the surface. But it still went deeper than most of the other articles that I found. Um, so I wanted to point those out. Um, now, the most recent for us, um, 2006, it was the 75th anniversary of her death. Um, there were 52 articles that were found, but again, very, very brief, very, very minimal. Um, really talked about, um, you know, her in passing, if you will. Um, and I put undertones here, again, the critical part of, of me, um, with a question mark. Just something to think about, because I drew some things with, um, with what I found, um, but I, I definitely would be interested to hear your thoughts. Um, but here's one from the New Pittsburgh Courier. <clears throat> uh, there are still too many people, black and white, who know of Barbara Walters, but not Ida B. Wells. I would agree with that. Um, but here's what I was talking about um, with an undertone, <clears throat> excuse me, um, these next ones coming up. Um, as against these atrocities, the struggles for true liberty and freedom in the lives, and then it lists these um, men, uh, but then Ida B. Wells stand out so visibly. And again, it goes back to that cultural amnesia aspect um, and so many people having no idea who Ida B. Wells is. 
if they're saying these people are so visible, are they referring to all of them or just the men? So again, something just to think about. Um, this next one was found in the Miami Times. It said, throughout our history, various voices have served our communities well simultaneously. Ida B. Wells worked against the lynching of black men while Mary Church Terrell worked on behalf of black women. So again, um, I, I highlighted it because is it implying that Ida, you know, there was a removal, that double bind, was there a removal that Ida wasn't working for black women? It was really just black men? I, I don't know, I can't answer that. It's just um, the approach to think about. Um, and then finally, there was this play review, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in the New York Times said, one of the most endearing segments in Constant Star presents Wells, strong and dignified, making a speech, but pausing now and then to reveal her inner state, so what's really inside, which is girlish and giggly. So again, strong and dignified is used to describe her, and in the exact same sentence, it talks about her inner state is really girlish and giggly. So again, it, it, there's a huge disconnect there. Um, and this is in the New York Times, so it's a, a major publication. Um, so finally, just um, some things to, to hopefully think about, and I'd love to um, talk to anyone more um, after the uh, panel session here. Um, anniversary coverage is largely missing. There does seem to be a cultural amnesia surrounding the memory of Ida B. Wells, um, at least in the newspapers that were found. Um, now again, this study is part of a larger scale where um, we did look at more dates, um, more publications, so of course we're limited by what we can have access to. Um, but just something to think about is this accountability aspect, especially in terms of uh, journalists. Um, journalists have really failed to provide nuanced accounts of individuals and uh, events in anniversary coverage, and that's a problem. Um, so just something to think about, how can journalists do a better job of providing these accounts of these things? Um, but also, um, this celebratory nature that we've already talked about also, does that kind of mask the struggles that really happen? Do people really want to forget or do people just want others to forget? Something to think about. Um, and then again, there's always this concept of uh, the double bind whenever people um, at these specific intersections of race and gender, such as Ida B. Wells, how do they identify, how are they presented in media and how are we remembering them? Thank you. And now we will have Mia Bay, who will serve as the discussant and also will help facilitate questions from the audience. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank all of the panelists for their very interesting papers. Um, really, uh, which I think came together really well to give us some very different perspectives on Wells. And I want to just um, begin by offering some brief comments on what they have to say and then throw things open to question. Um, first, RJ, are you actually called R RJ? Yeah, RJ. <laughs> okay, okay, RJ. Um, you discussed Wells's, uh, the, the ways in which Wells can be an inspiration for model, modern journalism, um, especially advocacy journalism. And I, I, you know, what, the things I was thinking as I was listening to your talk was that Wells saw the need for ad advocacy journalism, um, at least in part because she understood that white, the white Southern journalism of her era, and indeed much of the white journalism of his era, era was a form of advocacy journalism, or, or perhaps fiction. Um, and in thinking about that, I'm thinking about her, um, she made some comments in a 19, an 1893 article on the requirements of Southern journalism um, in which she talked about the white papers. She said to read the white papers um, is to hear that um, blacks were now getting, the black man was now getting away from the restraint of the inherent fear of the white man that it, which has controlled his passions and become this person from whom white women, women and children now flee as a wild beast. Um, and in talking to other journalists in this, in this paper, which she presented, 
uh, before a meeting of the National Press Association, which was an African-American press association, uh, she emphasized to other journalists that it was really the duty of all African-American journalists to correct the garbled accounts of the Associated Press. Black journalists, she wrote, um, should address every garbled and slanderous dispatch about African Americans associated by, uh, issued by the Associated Press. Um, so I think, I, I wonder if Wells might say that all journalists are advocates of some kind, whether they admit it or not, and sort of perhaps challenge the idea of any kind of objectivity in journalism. So perhaps we can address that during the question period. Um, Professor Broussard, um, fascinating to think about uh, anti-lynching as a PR campaign. And in thinking about it, you got me to think about abolitionism as a PR mm -hmm. campaign because one of the really striking things I think about Wells is how closely she modeled her anti-lynching campaign on the abolitionist campaign. I think she must have learned a lot from Frederick Douglass and also perhaps from some of the abolitionist school teachers with whom she studied as a young person. Um, she um, understood, I think, that uh, lynching like slavery was something that you had to change people's opinion about um, and that it required all of the techniques that you discussed. Um, the other connection I also thought, because anti-lynch, uh, because anti-slavery really takes shape within the context of um, uh, of sort of a, a kind of religious moment, is the ways in which it, it's sort of connected to religious thinking. I mean, one of the key forces behind uh, the more successful anti-slavery movement started that started in the 1830s was this I, this sort of Garrisonian idea of moral suasion, the idea that you uh, need to change people's mind, you need to change people's minds and hearts, you need to convince them um, that they w that slavery is a sin, um, which was uh, much debated during that time period because people quite justifiably questioned whether you can really create social change um, without sort of addressing things through political means, but retrospectively the sort of PR element of it where you really try to introduce a moral shift was very important even though politics would also be important to the end of slavery. So um, <laughs> I'd love to have you talk about any connection between PR and religion and how you would sort of trace that genealogy. Okay, um, okay let me just move down a little further through my notes. Um, Oh yes, and I was gra I was uh, delighted to hear about um, Ferdinand Barnett, who I think is a fascinating figure about whom we really should know a lot more. Um, Wells, I th Wells and Barnett were among several African Americans of their day who had unusually egalitarian marriages for the early 20th century um, in ways that is perhaps connected to. Um, sort of traditions of gender equity among mm -hmm. African Americans that go back to slavery. Um, Wells, if you look at her early life, she was an attractive woman. She wasn't perhaps girlish and giggly, but she was very attractive. She was an accomplished flirt. She had many suitors with whom she corresponded with. Um, and despite all this, she married very late for her, for, for the era, past 30, and she feared that she would never marry because she had trouble finding the type of man who she felt she could have a true partnership with. Um, and I think part of the problem was her activism. Susan B. Anthony, uh, another activist, was horrified when she heard that Wells would, got, would get married because she was convinced that the activism would be over then. Um, but in Barnett, she met someone um, with whom it was clear that that was not gonna happen. Um, Barnett was a widower. His first wife was uh, one of the very first black graduates at the University of Michigan. She had worked with him um, after she died of an illness. He hesitated to remarry because he wanted more than just a wife. He wanted a help meet, a partner in his life work. Um, and the two of them found uh, what they both needed in each other. Barnett had a newspaper Wells had lost her newspaper. 
she actually became the editor of the Chicago Concert Conservator right after they got married. No honeymoon, no anything. She just <laughs> jumped into the traces. Um, Barnett's status of a, as a lawyer allowed him to not only uh, help Wells with her civil rights war battles, but he also provided her with financial support because as an advocacy journalist, Wells had trouble making a living, um, which I know can be a problem in journalism even today, right? Um, she, um, at one point, she was sought out by a speaker's bureau to, to, you know, to give, to sort of travel around giving speeches because she was such a good speaker. But when she said she wanted to talk about lynching, they were like, no, 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 that won't do at all. So she wasn't able to make money in that kind of way. Um, so she really did rely on Wells, who, who on Barnett, who um, hired her nurse. Um, and just a few interesting things about him. He was sometimes called Mr. Ida B. Wells Barnett, or my, Mr. Ida B. Wells, which he did not seem to mind. Um, and he was an accomplished cook. His father had cooked aboard uh, some boats. And uh, he made dinner every night and seemed to like that as well. Um, so they, they, they were perfectly suited um, and had a notably a, a, a notably modern marriage. And then finally, thinking about the, the public memory, I was struck by um, the ways in which Wells is rem not remembered or remembered fleetingly also when I first began working on the biography of her. Um, biographies of Wells and many other black women have been very slow to emerge. And when I kind of look back over what had been written about both her and um, Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth, you know, until the until virtually the 90s, there were some children's books, there was the odd play. Um, it seemed like you were more likely to learn about them in grade school than hear about them and at any point later, which has always sort of been interesting to me. Um, I think part of the Im influence is historical. Um, Wells shaped the agenda of the modern civil rights movement. Um, especially with the anti-lynching, which was, became a primary issue taken up by the NAACP. P. But she began to be forgotten even during her lifetime, even as the NAACP began to do this. Um, in part, what was happening was that the early 20th century saw the professionalization of many professions um, and increasing barriers to the admission of women, um, and especially also increasing barriers to the admission of people like Wells who were self-educated in the early 20th century, someone like Du Bois begins to be exalted and he has these Harvard credentials and so forth. And Wells, I think, you know, as a woman who's not educated, also as a mother, I think, who sort of begin to, when mothers are supposed to be at home, um, it's, it's hard, it's, she, she's increasingly not seen as anything other than someone who might be behind the scenes. So I think that's part of that story. Um, so just with those observations, I'm going to close and throw things open to the audience to ask panelists questions and maybe also ask you to address some of my questions. Thank you. Welcome to the 2015 Ida B. and Beyond Conference, presented by the School of Journalism and Electronic Media at the University of Tennessee. Held in conjunction with the Association for Education and Journalism and Mass Communications 40th Annual Southeast Colloquium, this conference is a component of the Ida B. Wells Initiative, an interdisciplinary project to foster student and scholarly research on Ida B. Wells and other social justice crusaders. The 2015 Ida B. and Beyond Conference is brought to you by UT's Ready for the World program, the Vice Chancellor for Diversity, the Commission for Blacks, the College of Communication and Information at the University of Tennessee, the School of Journalism and Electronic Media, the Department of History and other private donations.